So I, um, I'm glad to be back. I grew up outside of Charlottesville. Both my parents are Cavaliers. I uh, went to school down in Lynchburg and um, just moved to Utah from a little town halfway between Leesburg and Winchester. So it's, it's kind of good to be back and um, uh, always enjoy it. As Jake said, my name is Alex. Uh, right now, I am the Director of Operations and Technology Risk for Zions Bancorp. Um, there. <laughs> and I'm not here on their behalf. I'll talk a little bit publicly about what we do and how we do it there uh, for a while. Um, but what I, my opinions are my own. They don't reflect the bank or any of our customers or anything like that. Um, before uh, I worked at Zions, um, I worked for a company called Verizon. And uh, there I was part of a team that put together a data breach report. Um, and so it was a lot of fun to work with that team, amazing individuals. A woman named Jack Jones uh, doing some uh, consulting. Um, before that, I worked for a company called Microsoft, yada, yada, yada. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about um, risk management. Half of you just went, ah, geez. And the other half of you went, okay, good, because I, I might have some problems um, or, or some challenges talking to the business. Um, I'm going to kind of throw this out, that you can't have one without the other. Risk management or security science, it's, it's kind of the same thing at this point. And it's going to get a little muddled, and the waters are going to get muddier over the next five years. We'll talk about why that is. Anybody know what this is? This is a picture of? Close. All right, we'll talk about it in a sec. So like I said, um, I'm speaking here as much as uh, um, uh, my words are as much uh, Zion's words as they are the President of the United States, which is to say none. Um, the inspiration for this talk, there are a couple of pieces. This is one. This is operational risk, of which technology is technically a part. Don't worry, most operas people have no idea what, what technology or information security is about. But it's really good. And um, if you're wondering a little bit about uh, the financial crisis and you like um, inference and uh, Bayesian methods and so forth, it's a fun read. The other inspiration is this. Um, when I have been a consultant uh, and when I've worked in risk groups, um, folks tend to worry about where risk is, um, not how much risk they have. There's a great story behind this uh, from my friend Jack Jones when he was Chief Information Security Officer at Nationwide. He was the brand new CISO at the time, and he was going to go in front of the Executive Council. So he had like the CEO and the CFO and the CEO, you know, he had everybody in the room, and he was going to go ask them for his $25 million budget. Right? And so he prepped, right? like most of us do. He prepped well, a lot. And he had all of these controls he wanted to buy and invest in and increase Right? And all of these threats he was all worried about and that stuff. And he talked and he talked and talked. And about seven minutes in, kind of what happened was this. The CFO goes, wait, this is all fine, Jack. Let me ask you a question. How much risk do we have? And, and Jack's like, we're nationwide. We got lots of risk. You know, what, what do you mean, how much risk? He goes, okay. CFO goes, if I give you... $25 million, how much less risk will I have? And Jack's like, not so much. Um, but it's, it's not a bad question when you sit down and think about it. It's not unrealistic. You know, if my kid came to me and said, Dad, I want $10, I'm going to say, why? Right? That's all that he was doing. What's my return on my investment? Tell me what I'm getting. Compliance only buys a piece of that, right? To be able to say, well, we'll get the regulators off the back. Maybe they'll take the regulators on their back for a while. So how much risk we do we have is a great question. Even better question is why. Okay. So uh, like I do with most of my audiences, I like to level set a little bit, um, just so we have kind of a shared mindset. Um, there's no risk free. There's no such thing as secure. If you believe you've got something that is secure, um, this might be a difficult concept here. Um, Hopefully, nobody thinks that they are secure. 
Um, risk is currently a hypothetical construct. And what that means is this. You can't touch it. You may be able to observe it, but it's something that we create in our minds. And we'll go into a little bit of, of how we as humans have dealt with hypothetical constructs and created meaning out of them in the past in a little bit. Um, but you cannot touch risk. Okay? And, and the last one is that there are different risk approaches. Okay? And this is kind of interesting. Um, let's talk about that for, or for a bit here. Uh, starting with what is risk. If you go to um, your dictionary on your laptop or you, you bust open Webster's, you're going to find a bunch of different definitions um, and a bunch of different meanings, uh, sometimes as many as 12, right? Um, a great example from my past has been the, f the first time I ever ran across a chief risk officer was a, a big old financial institution out of Florida. And they had, we had done a pen test, and we had found what you and I might, we'll call an issue, right? So we had the CIO, the CRO, the CFO, and the CEO in the room, and we, we've got issues, right? Um, and the CRO goes, that's a risk. The CIO goes, that's a vulnerability. The CFO goes, that's a threat. They're all talking about the same issue, the same, the same object, applying different semantic labels to that. And if you listen to the word risk, and frankly, I'm sick of the word risk, to tell you the truth, you'll hear a lot of that. What's interesting is the Japanese, the Japanese didn't, before Western influence, did not have a word. They were one of two um, civilizations that did not have a word risk in their lexicon. Does that mean they did not have the concept? Absolutely not. It just meant when they were describing it, they were a little more particular. So instead of saying pizza, right, they probably said, Oh, you mean the pie with the tomato sauce and the cheese. Make sense? Um, in the same way, we have different views of risk uh, that we classify by what we do. First would be financial risk. When I deal with um, our CRO, he's got an entire side of the house that's dealt with financial risk. And financial risk is qualified like this. And I, I use baseball a lot. You'll forgive me if you don't like it. Um, but uh, a financial risk is you've got an investment and that investment's going to deviate from an expected return. So you got, are the Braves still in Richmond? You've got a Richmond Brave, right? And, uh, no, who is it now? What? Wow, <laughs> oh, okay, so you got a flying squirrel, right? And, and people have invested in this flying squirrel. Flying squirrel, are you serious, Brian? Um, you need a t-shirt before you leave. The, um, uh, so you've got this flying squirrel, and somebody's probably given this 17, 18 year old kid how much? Like $3 million, whatever, but they expect something out of him. Now, a couple things may happen. He may be completely healthy and not really live up to standards. He may break his arm, he may not live up to standards. He may exceed his standards, he may become an all-star. My St. Louis Cardinals, when uh, they had this player named Albert Pujols, they ran into that problem because he was way too good, right? They had an investment there, it went way too good on them, and they couldn't afford to keep them, thank goodness. Um, so a financial risk, that's what people are talking about. You've got a deviation from expected return. Engineering risk that you and I are familiar with, that comes from the Dutch, okay? And what you basically have is a system or something, and it's operating at what you expect, and then it deviates from that, um, only degrades, though. Your firewall doesn't really operate at 110, 120%. This isn't the enterprise that we're dealing with, right? Um, you've got something that happens. Now, back to our pitcher example, right? He's got an arm. That arm has a certain amount that he can give us. Um, but if he needs Tommy John surgery, it's not going to be able to give us much at all, right? And even after that surgery, it may never be the same. I see this as a symptom of an audit-driven approach. Where is the risk, right? Figure out where your bridge is, is hurting you, and go reinforce that bridge. Anybody know what this is a picture of? Tacoma Narrows, right. If you ever see this on YouTube, if you don't know what this is, this is a bridge they built in the 40s, I think. And uh, in certain wind um, conditions, it goes like this, or it went like that, right? And that's what you see here is, is uh, it's, it's not a lot of fun to be on that. Um, and so as we do a risk and control self-assessment, that's an operational risk term. And sure enough, 
if you, if you live with uh, somebody who has not risk discipline, they do this on you, um, you have this equation, okay? Which is, and the concept of inherent risk minus our controls equals our residual risk. Anybody seen this before? A couple of unfortunate folks, right? What this is, how awesome is your bridge? Right, that's what this is uh, talking about. The problem with that is what everybody who's ever tried to actually capture a flag knows. Wind has no motivation, right? Wind isn't saying, oh, I'm gonna really gonna get this bridge now, right? And rain does not try to evade the bridge's defenses, right? The, the final problem with this is, is if this system is faulty by design, <laughs> anybody got some, some systems that are faulty by design? Um, if the system is faulty by design, reinforcement's only addressing a symptom, okay? It's not until you just destroy the bridge and rebuild it that you're actually addressing the design. The last problem with this is that it doesn't really give us a good view of the whole system, right? So there's this concept called complex systems, right? And it's interconnected parts, um, and it has synergistic qualities. You push on it, and something crazy happens over at the other end, right? You have cross-site scripting, and all of a sudden, some other system somewhere far away is compromised. Sound kind of familiar to us all a little bit, right? Um, so you have these unintended consequences um, that are basically emergent properties, if you want to talk about it specifically. My favorite example is this. Uh, I worked with a team, prior to my working with them, they were bought up by a great big team. Right? And the great big team by this great big company, they said, well, you've got to have strong passwords on these things. Right? You need a special character, you need numbers, you need eight characters at least. Anybody else suffer through that? Handful of nods, right? So these were clever risk guys, though, and what they did was this. They, they made a little study, and they showed that you're actually more likely to die in a car accident trying to unlock your phone than, ha than to have suffer a data breach by using a simple two-character password. Do you think the large organization changed policy? Yeah, no, right? Now that's interesting, but what that organization just said is we would rather kill you than suffer a data breach, right? I think it's really kill you than, than face the wrath of internal or external auditors, but anyway. Sorry if there's auditors in the crowd. Um, so we may be dealing with a complex adaptive system. I actually called a lady who's an expert on this. She worked for uh, Gene Spafford at Purdue for a little bit. And I said, great, tell me if we are. She goes, there's no litmus test. It's not binary. You got a bunch of smells like. That's why that word may is in this slide, right? But it sure does feel like it. Last problem with this, um, <coughs> science is hard. Uh, this is a gentleman named Thomas Kuhn. He's smarter than all of us. Um, and he's a philosopher of science. And he said there's this thing called a proto-science, right? And there's a difference between pseudoscience and a proto-science. And a proto-science is somewhat random fact-gathering, mainly of readily accessible data. A morass of interesting, trivial, and irrelevant observations. Um, I call that Sands uh, Top 20. So a variety of theories that are spawned from what he calls philosophical speculation, and those are critical controls. Um, just kidding. Uh, if I didn't warn you, I'm going to make fun of all of us, myself included, throughout this. Um, but the, the, the idea here is he sees science growing. And as I look at it, we very much fit the proto-science uh, category. This is another smart gentleman named Dan Deere. Um, and Dan is talking about um, science and measurement, and he says, we have an ordinal scale at best. Um, we can kind of tell you that X is better or Y, but we can't figure out how much. So I thought, well, geez, we have this hypothetical construct called risk, right? Feels like it exists. How, does, how, how have we dealt with these things, and how have we gone from hypothetical to science in the past? So I'd like to use speed as an um, example, right? Because <laughs> in terms of metrics, the first metric was very binary uh, around speed, 
<laughs> are you faster than the woolly mammoth or not? It's survival based, right? Um, then you get the next step, which is comparison, um, <laughs> um, which is you've got Ulysses and Homer, and they're running a race in the Olympics, and one is faster than the other, right? Now, as the distances get shorter, it's harder to measure that. As they get longer, then you can start talking about, well, the sun was here when one got to the finish line, the sun was there when the other one did, right? Finally, right, we got to something called units. We were able to say, okay, there are 24 hours in a day, 60 um, seconds in a minute, yada, yada, right? So thinking about that, if science is based on have, having these inductive observations, if science is based on the ability to measure in terms of units, um, where do we sit as information security and risk in the family of sciences? The answer is not good, okay? Um, in the family of sciences, uh, we're like my, my Ted. Um, and if you think I'm kidding, let's take CVSS, for example. Now, I'm going to pick on them. They're really good guys. They know that they have this problem. They would love to fix it. Um, I, I sat on a DEF CON panel with some folks here, and, and they, were, they were nice folks. But it doesn't, it doesn't I'm just using them as they are symptomatic, right, of, of how we deal with risk and security. If you take this, the base equation multiplies impact by 0.6 and exploitability by 0.4. Right? This is a lot like saying jet engine times peanut butter equals shiny. Right? It, it, it really, it, it may be right, okay, but when it's wrong, you don't know why, and when it's right, you kind of don't know really why. The other thing about this is, is I love 0.6 and 0.4. Folks, decimals aren't magic, okay? <laughs> if you can add a zero before or after that number, all right? and it doesn't change the meaning of the outcome, you're, you're doing it wrong, all right? That, that, it, the world does not work that way. So finally, if we have this, and we're dealing with this, and you got some guy coming in and trying to talk to you about this, this is called a point probability for a complex system. If you start aggregating this up and saying, well, in aggregate, all our web servers are low, or medium, or high, or, or in aggregate, this is how it works. Right? And especially if you're just using these qualitative descriptors. That doesn't work either. There's people who are much smarter than we are that's, that have decided that that was silly a long, long time ago. And yet we continue to do it. Right? So in a complex system, actually what you're, what, what you're dealing with is, is trying to find patterns. Right? Anybody know what that's a, a, a picture of? There it is. It, it's flights. It's, it's U.S. flight patterns and paths, but you can see the United States. Everybody, everybody who can see that side kind of went, oh, there's Florida and there's California, and good night, everybody's flying through Denver on United. So um, RCSAs is commonly performed. This is basically a cargo call. Everybody know what a cargo call is? For those, some people do. So for those who don't, what happened was uh, in World War II, um, you know, the, the Marines and the Navy went island hopping. They would go to this tiny island, and they'd build up, uh, you know, maybe a port, but you'd certainly have an airfield, and all this cargo would come in, and the natives would benefit um, a little bit, right? Um, because, you know, all of a sudden they had access to foods and, and material goods that they'd never seen before, right? And then, but then the Marines and the Navy left, okay? And so did it with, so, so went with them, went the good times for the natives, right? So what they did is they wanted them to come back. Now, they didn't understand what was going on. And so what they did was they built planes and vehicles and airfields like it's Gilligan's Island, right? And then started praying to these things so that the cargo and the good times would come back, bring us back the liquor, you know, whatever it was. That's, a, that's, that's what people mean when they talk about a cargo call. We're much like that. If we're, we're trying very, very hard to have equations and metrics and meaning, but what's happening, and we should all understand this, is that we're creating bamboo airplanes, bamboo Cessnas. So we have to augment this with something else. And I'm going to call this medical risk. Uh, note that it, it's from Criminology 2. So this is Dr. Snow, and he, he was... Um, the founder of uh, what we might call uh, epidemiology. We do call it epidemiology. We might call him the founder. 
And um, it, if you've seen Tufti's book on data viz, this is uh, one of the first great data visualizations. In London, during his time, there was the cholera outbreak. And at the time, people believed that cholera was due to ill wind or whatever it was, right? And he said, you know, that's, that's, that's horse pucky. And what he did was, he, put a, he took a map and he put a dot where everybody died. And he had this hypothesis that he wanted to prove. It was actually a waterborne illness. Okay, and so the X's became uh, pumps, kind of communal pumps where people would go and get their water. And look at this. You can see the cluster around that X right there, right? You can totally see that cluster. And sure enough, that pump lives to today, somebody had built a pump three meters away from an abandoned cesspool, right? And so they were getting cholera by what the means we know of it today. So epidemiology, um, uh, there are risk, fa risk factors, determinants that we find, um, markers. Um, yeah, everybody know, has heard the old saw correlation uh, is not necessary causation, but it, it sure does help us understand what's going on um, if we bring in a deductive model uh, to back that up. It's basically the means to find patterns, right? So it's designed to address the problems we face when we look at complex systems. This is Dr. Richard Cook. He's made an awesome document here. Um, this link will be embedded in the slides that you can have. Um, and it deals with complex systems and failures. And I, I put a couple of quotes up, because um, I think these are awesome. When I read these, uh, again, there's no litmus test for complexity and security. But boy, it felt good. Um, the, complex, the complexity of the systems makes it impossible for them to run without multiple vulnerabilities being present. Right? Um, these are individually insufficient to cause failure, uh, but you get enough of them, and, and bad things will happen. And they're always running in degraded mode. Um, security or risk is a characteristic of the systems and not their components. Anybody who's done pen testing can tell you this. Right? Um, you're attacking the system itself as much as you're attacking an individual server, or individual end user. Um, emergent property, all that great stuff. I, I strong, it's, a, it's a three, two, three page document, um, and it's just a, a collection of, kind of, of these sorts of bits of wisdom that he has found um, that you can download. It's a good time. So we're worried about how awesome our bridge is, right? And everybody is telling us, that's neat, but you need more. We might want to rethink our approach, OK? Um, and it's seriously, right? What would happen if your doctor operated like we do with our business, right? It, it, it becomes difficult for the business to go out and play. Um, but the good news is there are some examples. This is uh, a friend of mine named Gene Kim, and he did the, through the IT Process Institute, he looked at a series called Visible Ops for IT and Visible Ops for Security. And it was amazing what they found, right? Um, in terms of, of uh, organizations that did not have, that had fewer incidents, right? Organizations that did not have significant outages, right? One of the great things that they found was um, the organizations, uh, one of the weird things that uh, correlated with organizations that had lower amounts of incidents, the uh, CISO was ex-military or ex-audit. Um, I thought that was fascinating. There was another one that I, got, I was fortunate to be a part of, um, Peter Tippett and Verizon and the data breach reports. Um, we created something called Veris to start categorizing these things, and it's open. Uh, but it was an object-oriented model each incident, each piece of an incident had an agent, had an action, an asset, and an attribute, right? Somebody hurts us, they hurt something, and then something bad happens, okay? More often than not, a series of those things. And what was cool when we went through this, and I wish I had built this, uh, but somebody else on the team got there and did it. He's a great guy named Chris Porter, um, is holy cow, you've got your actions, malware hacking, social misuse, error, physical environment, 
um, where it came from, external, internal, partner, threat, what they acted against, servers, networks, user devices, offline data, and then confidentiality and integrity, what was compromised. So what's cool about this is um, uh, a huge portion of it uh, is blank. So if we really have super sophisticated, awesome attackers, maybe so, maybe we're, maybe we're not causing them to be super sophisticated, maybe the most data breaches are relatively simple stuff, but the important thing is that they are, these are patterns, right? These are, these are people dying of cholera near a water pump, okay? <laughs> but again, we're still worried about how awesome our bridge is, okay? Um, we're not worried necessarily about who built it, how it was built, how we're operating. Um, a friend of mine likes to say, we've spent the last uh, 15, 20 years as, as an industry of installers. Buy a 1U box, install it, and don't worry necessarily about operating it. Because that operating expense comes out of a different accounting bucket than uh, the capital expenditure. What we really should be worried about, really, is how much are we associated with failures? How our behaviors associate us with failures? That's an uncomfortable conversation because it involves IT. Um, we should also be worried about how good our lifestyle is, right? There's a concept called micromorts that comes to us from uh, medical uh, folks. And the micromort is the one in a millionth chance of death. You smoke one cigarette, you get three micromorts, three in a millionth chance of death, right? And so when we do inherent minus controls equals residual, we're really saying, did I smoke a cigarette or not? What we're not saying is in most audit standards, almost every audit standard I've seen, never says, hey, are you smoking two packs a day? Those are two different behaviors and two different outcomes you're going to get. So um, let's talk a little bit about some change. Um, uh, I'll have a little bit of a manifesto for you here. Um, security and risk management must provide value and address the need and be ethical. A real simple kind of credo that I'd like my team to live by, right? To be ethical, uh, we need to be data scientists. This is data scientist Ryan Gosling um, and a little bit of uh, probability joke for you guys. Uh, <laughs> Bayesian jokes, not so good. Take slide out. Um, but basically, uh, in operating as a data scientist, um, at a very high level, there's only four things to really study. You got the threats, you got the assets, you got the impacts, and you got the controls. Now, it's worth noting that if we're going to have these boardroom discussions, or we're going to have discussions with auditors, and my auditors especially, you got to have all four to get risk. Okay? If, you, if you don't have all four in the equation, you're talking about something, but it ain't risk yet. Okay? Right? And, and impact is not how the system is going to fail. Impact is whose cost center is, is going to pay for it. You're going to need a framework to understand data, a big old pot of data, and some models to help you interpret it. Okay? Bringing those circles back in, you've got the individual circles as data. Sometimes there's overlap if you get the picture. Um, you bring them together to understand risk within the context of a framework. Well, I like to use Verus uh, as that. And then there's models, and I have a couple of models that my team uses, right? And that synthesizes knowledge, all those overlaps. So at, at Zions, we pretty much quickly figured out um, we got to be data-driven. Uh, we have to know the individual parts. Um, and uh, the relationships between those parts Right, and then we can start discussing the whole. So, like I said, Varus uses that. Um, we've got um, a boatload of data that we're going to need in order to do that. How big is a boatload? Well, if this is the Varus sort of thing that you've got, this is uh, six million combinations. This is at its highest level. We we have millions and millions of squares, right? And so how, how big is a boatload? A lot. And uh, we pretty quickly realized that we're going to need a bigger boat. Uh, when, so, uh, so here's the big data piece. Anybody sick of hearing about big data yet? Yay, good for you. All right, so 
I'll tell you why you're sick of hearing about it um, and what you can do about it. So we call it security data warehousing because um, we're cool like that. Uh, but basically, we have a data warehouse, uh, 1.2 petabytes. What we've done at the bank is uh, uh, the CSO um, uh, that I report to, uh, I'm now peers with physical, BCPDR, fraud, and InfoSec. Okay, it makes sense. So you have all of these people who are essentially the same organization. Um, that way we can get all of those various categories and data out of it. error um, coming to us, the physical, um, all, of, all of them working together in a 1.2 petabyte bunch of information. And we use Hadoop for that. That's our boat. And so if you think of it this way, we have a lot of stuff that goes through MapReduce um, through an ETL system. And then my portion of it, and we'll talk a different about how fraud and InfoSec uses it, but for risk management, right, I get Mongo or Couch. Um, we're, we're starting to play with Couch a little bit. Um, and that supports my workflow, our analytics, and our reporting. That's that little thing here. I'm able to do that sort of stuff with it now. Um, this is no different whether it's InfoSec or fraud. They just have a, a different perspective on it. So conceptually, you've got cloud. <laughs> I said cloud. Um, you can punch me later. Um, uh, you've got all this information sitting out there. We drop it all in Hadoop, do some MapReduce, and then we do our analytics. Does that make more sense? Okay. This is um, uh, an example of the mind map that we built for um, a vendor owned SaaS app, right? Um, and all of the metadata that we associate that with that. The CNA, there is a certification and accreditation of the vendor themselves that comes through. Um, uh, so we at least capture this data. We do that in an interview process. We stopped asking for a bunch of controls. We figured out. Uh, pretty quickly that people can lie to us just as well as we can lie to other vendors about how many controls are in place. Um, <laughs> uh, so what we do is we do an interview um, and we kind of test how, maturity, how mature you are um, by a different amount of, of questions. Um, and so this is some of the data. You capture. So, so what we've done, what I like to think of it is, is actually this is a picture of uh, a visualization of the human genome. I'm trying to, to do genomic sequencing on the bank core. That's it, around risk, security. Um, clause two here, uh, all that's well and good, but unless you're stopping bad guys, it's stupid. Uh, this is a basic um, data processing workflow. All that to say, risk management is an intelligence function. And I realize that's kind of duh, but think about it. Whether I'm working with fraud, and low-level fraud analysts, or whether I'm reporting to any number of board of directors, we're actually a bank core, so I, I have the, the pleasure of reporting to nine different boards of directors. Um, I'm giving them intel, helping them make a decision. So um, the three types that we see here, um, I kind of deal in real-time tactical and strategic, is how I think about it, and I'm only one of these pieces. Real time, this is where InfoSec and fraud come together. Um, and you see risks role is kind of my role there, right? Um, it, it's basically mining that Hadoop cluster and trying to do near real time uh, detect and respond. Uh, tactical security ops, um, there's a feedback back loop between the, the director of InfoSec and myself there on where we think kind of hot zones are where to kind of go focus efforts. And then I'm, at, I'm the icing on the cake. Um, I do high level patterns, trending and reporting. But the important thing is there's feedback loops between all of us. Now what's cool about this is that um, machine learning is helping us stop bad guys. Right? The reason to go out and get data sources from vendors, um, uh, not to pimp a particular vendor, but um, you know, the risk-based security folks out there, uh, the reason to go do that is so that you can start stopping bad guys with a combination of, of behavioral analytics and machine learning. That's why big data is a big deal, but here's the crux of that and what your vendors don't understand. <laughs> it's not about big data. You can do a lot with little data. 
if you have a right hypothesis. And to have a right hypothesis, you need to have a data scientist. Let me give you a personal example of where this industry is going. Okay. I had the pleasure of being invited to sit and listen to a big data security vendor recently. Right? I'm like, oh, yeah, OK. Um, I'll go listen to this, whatever. Um, so I sit through, and I'm hearing a whole lot about throughput from this folks. And I can understand why, after listening to them, why some people think of big data as nothing more than SIM warmed over. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not. Let me tell you why. As soon as this vendor has done their spiel, I said, sweet. That's interesting stuff. Looks like you have some neat one, they actually were three U, you know, with some interesting rack mount technology. And again, it's, <laughs> this vendor's big data solution is built so that I can point to something and go, there's my big data solution. It's the orange box, right? Um, but, but I said, that, that's a sweet solution. So let me ask you this. How, I, I'm hearing all this stuff and I'm a little familiar. How am I connecting my HR system with that? How am I going to get data from an HR system onto your big data solution? And the vendor looked at me like I was from frickin' Mars. They're like, why would you want to do that? Right? And I said, well, there are lots of reasons I'd want to do that. First, my two favorite metrics, riskiest cost center and stupidest employee. Right? Those are, those are great, great metrics for me to have. Um, and they're, they're actionable, really. From a political standpoint, those are crazy good actionable metrics, all right? Well, and this vendor looked at me like, well, you, you wouldn't. You just leave that data over there on the HR system. I'm like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if you know about this big data stuff, but I don't think that's how it works. And the second thing I asked was this. Okay, so you, you obviously have a lot of people buying your big data solution. How many of your CISOs that have bought your solution have a data scientist reporting directly to them? None. Not a one. This guy's like, what? Uh, if they are, it's, it's because they're medical and those guys are working on, you know, uh, genes or something, or uh, they're in marketing, you know? I'm like, well, then how are you doing this? Now, that's not to say we have to go hire data scientists to take advantage of behavioral analytics and to, to start stopping bad guys. We, uh, at an hardware organization, we've had a really good time taking really smart security analysts and then giving them, you know, R for beginners, <laughs> right? Or, or a handful of tool sets and letting them become autodidacts around that. But the point is this. If you're buying da big data solutions and you have no idea what data science is, it's going to fail. Okay? You're going to waste a lot of money. The other thing is this. Let's say you did get a data scientist like we did. And RSA or some vendor came in and said, hey, we're the big data solution. And you, you buy us and, and off the shelf everything's awesome. Your data scientists look at them like they were nuts. Like, why would I buy a security company solution? Right? That's like, <laughs> that's like going to a, a pizza shop and asking them if they can build me a moped. You know, they're, they're two different things. Maybe sometimes you eat pizza while you're on your moped. But why would I do that? And why would I pay money? Hadoop is free. R's free. Or gobs of free tools. Maybe I'll spend some money on Splunk. So data, big data is not the solution. Data science is, okay? And for those of you who are sick of hearing about this stuff, that's because nobody wants to tell you the hard story, no vendor's ready to tell you the hard story, that the answer is in headcount, not in CapEx. Thanks. All right, so let me give you some current successes. I, I talked about one riskiest call center. Um, time of connection is great. So badge system, desktop connection, HR database, why is so-and-so's system connecting to China at 3 in the morning? Right? What is he doing? Why is somebody in engineering connecting to China at 3 in the morning? Right? Now you can argue, well, you, know, you just ought only worry about connections with China. Oh, they're the APT. But um, the reality is, um, if you're a member of the defense industrial base, you're already connecting to China for valid reasons, right? If, if you have a, a manufacturing piece, you're doing that. So, and, and then systems connected is, is wonderful. It's, it's real time. Um, you know, when you connect to our bank um, and start to do wire transfers, try to do wire transfers, we already have, um, you know, behavioral analytics. We already have 
um, analytics around whether or not you're compromised. Um, so that, that's been key in keeping our fraud rates, rates lowest in the industry. Um, we have to support national decision making. Analysis and state analysis. Fair we use. Find the qualitative means, but if you find some smart kid on this campus, they'll be able to build you a quantitative model out of, out of the of modeling there, and then state analysis. So how much risk do I have, and how well am I living? Is, is how I've decided to, to measure my stuff. So in fair, you've got um, uh, a threat. They have to they have to have some frequency of touching you in order for them to really be a threat. Because if they never touch you, they're not a threat, right? Um, or if they touch you one in 200 years versus 200 times a day, they're different types of threat. That threat has a capability. Not all threats are created equal. Um, this is why most people yell about antivirus and firewalls not being effective. Well, they're effective, but they're effective against a certain capability level. Um, they're completely ineffective against other capability levels. Uh, the strength of our controls, um, we use a ratio scale. Uh, comparing ourselves against the population. There are other models that I can't expose there. Um, uh, but we do that so that we're not multiplying jet engine by, by peanut butter. Um, and that gets us to a uh, Bayesian likelihood. Uh, over here, we've got impacts, and we do rough activity-based cost accounting. But we do a quantitative analysis, and sure enough, we can get tail events to show up by doing multi Monte Carlo simulations. I think this is 3,000 Monte Carlo simulations uh, for some make-believe threat scenario that I've left out. But you can see most of the time it's only cost, it, it's, not, it's costing us between 10,000 and you know, probably about $8 million on this scale with large concentrations closer to a million. I hate logarithmic scales, so what I did was I actually changed this to a surface area to show uh, executives where I said, well, we, were, we ran a bunch of simulations. Most of the time it was here, but you need to sh see this there, and you may not be able to see it, but um, you know, there may be actually a very small dot there. That's your tail risk. So that's what FAIR does for us uh, when we look at things, and that's been really useful. I personally have used FAIR with a oil company to discuss whether or not Hugo Chavez was going to nationalize their infrastructure. Um, I've used it for organizations that are worried about web servers. They're worried about natural disasters. It's been a very flexible tool in the data science toolbox. Um, it is not, I'll caution you with this, this isn't a religion. This is a model. It's, it's a hypothesis. It's built to be destructed. It's built to be improved. Right? Next thing I do is a, is a scorecard. Right? This is the how well I'm living. So FAIR tells me, did I smoke, am I smoking a cigarette, or how many sm cigarettes I'm smoking? This is, do I have a lifestyle that's, that's causing me to smoke two packs a day and I don't realize it, because it's happening all over my organization. Okay, and so what we do is, uh, we do a little bit of a touch point with folks. So at least once a quarter, I'm reaching out to the guy who actually has the cost centers, and I'm giving them the dollar amounts, um, but I'm also telling them um, whether or not they're, you know, kind of 42-year-old, slightly overweight guys who need to exercise more and drink too much. Um, but I really see this as this. And this is what's interesting to me, is when you go and you talk to, you look at um, ISO, or you look at um, uh, Risk IT from, well, I guess now it's incorporated into COVID. You look at these standards, and they're built to give you one true metric. Right? Now, for years and years and years, we didn't do that with baseball cards. In fact, you can look at the back of a baseball card, and you can see, hey, there's all these sorts of things. And back to the, the comparison stuff, right? This is great. This is an old baseball card where they only give us one metric, which is batting average. But they do give us this wonderful qualitative um, label on this Kevin Connors guy, a colorful, hard-hitting first baseman. I don't know what colorful was a euphemism for in the 50s, but it sounds pretty fun. Um, but you can now take this, and this is baseballreference.com, and good night, you can get a lot of data. You can even get forecasting and probabilistic data out of it. So I want to leave you with this. It's kind of an easy, open tool. 
um, that I've, I've you know, created and released. I call it the risk fish um, because the problem space can be confusing to talk about. Um, and because people want to fix um, uh, an easy system rather than the hard problem, what I did was I borrowed from this man who was also very, very smart. He's the father of quality circles. And he created what was the fish diagram. Anybody heard of a fish or an Ishikawa diagram for root cause analysis? Good, good. So um, for those of you who don't, fish diagram is measurements, materials, personnel. So what's, what goes wrong on the factory floor? Well, it's got to be one of these root causes or a combination of these root causes in most cases. What are the combinations? How do I have that complex scenario built out in front of me? Uh, around, the, uh, around what happened on the factory floor, what caused production or quality issues. Well, if you took uh, Verisk, okay, which is, you know, you've got thousands and thousands of, of data breaches that have been successfully classified using this ontology or taxonomy. Well, you can do the same sort of thing. You've got agents, attributes, impacts, controls. Now, Verisk doesn't have controls bring your own 27,002 or find your own matrix. We all got them out the wazoo. Um, actions from Verus and assets, right? And so, um, and you can get this uh, in a couple of places. So what my team does is, is um, if they want to look at a problem, right, instead of saying, well, this could happen and that could happen and this could happen and that could happen and holy cow, why are we bringing in iPads? Oh my gosh, freak out, right? What we can do is we can diagram out, do a little basic threat modeling here, and talk about it. And then we can go to data source and we can say, so let's go uh, to um, data loss database and let's try and find how many data breaches contain the word iPad. What's the risk? Right? What's the risk for? What's the risk now is different from what the risk forecast is because the half of you just went, he doesn't see iPads as risky. Of course, there's some risk inherent in it. The question is how much, not where it is. And so there's a risk forecast as well. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave you kind of with this. Uh, it, you know, I'll steal from the Daily Show. Moment of Zen, and, and I give this to my guys. Um, uh, I'm sick of the confusion around big data. I'm sick of the confusion around the word risk and hearing it from 10 different people. Heck, I have, I have the largest formal risk group in the organization, um, <laughs> and yet there are literally hundreds of risk, people with risk management in their title that do nothing around risk management. So uh, my moment is in for you is this, which is the point at which you can remove the word risk. I'll also add secure from your vocabulary is the point at which you really do understand and can communicate effectively what you're talking about. Because like the Japanese prior to Western influence, you're not using a crutch word. You have to be a little more specific. It has to be a little more meaningful with the business, and whether that business person is the guy running your sim or whether the business person is your CEO. Yeah, so it's, um, everybody wants everything to be black and white, and it's a lot more grayer than that. And that's why um, somebody just asked me, risk management, art versus science. I'm like, it's neither, right? You're a craftsman, and scientific tools and other tools help you as a craftsman. Anybody seen Jiro Dreams of Sushi, right? Um, my goal is to be Jiro, not, not to, to, to um, pretend like I, I can come to the one true answer. Um, so in terms of making business justification, absolutely. Right? We can point to ABA data and our fraud rates. We can point to um, attempts, uh, and we do exposure versus loss. It's easier in fraud and banking. Um, understand that, that, it, that I, I, do, I do recognize that I'm in a unique situation. Banks have a process that they're, <laughs> a series of processes that they've been really careful about for a long time, not as giving other people money, right? Um, this has uh, uh, been a more controlled environment than, say, software development or hardware engineering or building an airplane if you're Boeing, um, or even building a missile, uh, given the, the recent news. So it's easier for us to say the exposure from wire fraud was $40 million. The actual wire fraud was $400,000. 
and you're spending, I'll, the Jack Jones number, rough number, this is not my budget or, our, our, or my boss's budget, you're spending $20 million, right? Then the question is, well, what if I give you 18, right? And that's where, that's where you have to take the, um, the, the, the concept of, that's where we can't rely and why, why our, our standards aren't helping us because that's saying, oh, well, I'm an individual. I play some tennis, I drink some beer, right? You're asking me to cut back on the hours that I can focus on something. Am I gonna cut back on the beer drinking or am I gonna cut back on the tennis, right? And is it just tennis or are there a number of other things that I do, like traveling away from my family, that, that may add to my stress, right? So you have to understand what makes healthy and what makes unhealthy, right? And, and not from a, this, you know, like we have best practices sort of standpoint, but you have to understand what makes healthy and unhealthy in order to get to that point, in my opinion, in order to get to that point where you can say, okay, great, you're gonna cut me to $18 million, or you're gonna increase me to $25 million, what you're gonna get for that is this, right? And if you cut me for, cut me to $18 million, I can take that from 10 different disciplines, uh, and which do you want? And you can use like an analytical hierarchical process for multi-criteria decision making if you really wanna get funky about it with a calculus of preference and say to them, well, what do you wanna lose, right? Let's go through this and objectively discuss what you wanna lose so it's not a political battle. Um, I've seen people do that. Did that for a credit card company when I was uh, uh, with another organization. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you've got to use a number of things. Data Viz is another great one. Jay Jacobs and Bob Rudis presented an RSA. I can't tell you how awesome their Data Viz um, uh, uh, presentation was because it helps us in that craftsman sense build the story for execs. Anyway, hope that helps. Yes, please. How involved is the process of collecting the data? It is an insatiable hunger. Right. Right, so it's, um, so the, the question is um, kind of how do you figure out and how do you actually get the data? So how do you figure out the data? Um, I try and start here and then I try and work backwards. And this is again high level, right? If you're looking for like he's mapping these two, there's, there's literally hundreds of different things under, under Veris. Go download the JSON and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, that's why cost center or, or employee, craziest employee are, are great metrics um, because I can, I can go down to that level using a, a formal ontology. So threat scenarios and intelligence coming in mapped with, um, mapped against using this and then I can start identifying where I'm gonna get data. And then it's, it, we have you know, massive ETL system, extract, transform, load. So grab that stuff in. We also have some um, we have some unique technology, some that was built in-house, some that were um, kind of testing for other organizations um, that help us do it very quickly in the case of, of fraud analytics. But you get that stuff in. And it really is political, it, it really is in the name of security and fraud, I claim ETL to this server. I don't care what it is. Your audit, so what? Security and fraud says I need access to your server. Now I pull that in so that I can keep ahead of where they're gonna audit next and what they're doing. But it, it's everything, right? It's the PMO tool, right? And understanding in the MapReduce effort helps us understand what those, think of them as fields, right? Uh, what the fields are and what we care about and why we would do that. And then I can look through my, my corpus or my library of, of, of assets that are pulled in and I can say, hmm, I want the badge system I want time of connection uh, from the network equipment, um, and I want cost center from HR, and now I can understand um, why somebody's computer is accessing the internet while he's not even badged in, right? 
Um, that's a very simple example. There are obviously much more complex examples that, that we put through. But it, it really is um, being able to say in the name of security and fraud, I'm going to create an ETL layer and there's not much you can do about it because I have the right and the policy to do that. And then it's very much uh, now understand what that data means to me. Um, it's all about hypothesis building based on threat modeling, which is why the, we, you know, we use the risk fish pretty uh, across the board to create those hypotheses. No, no, we've got the, we've, we've hired folks. I, I, have, I have created some, some um, um, wonderful relationships. So VCU, heck, any CISOs in the room want to play with this, you don't have to have Hadoop, you can start with Mongo. Go find yourself some of these biostats kids or econometrics kids who look for R on the, uh, on the resume and start, get, start making real good friends with them and their, their intern program. Um, I'm fortunate in Salt Lake City that there are a handful of decent programs that I can choose from very locally and pull people in. We also, like I said, take, the, take some sharp people who are inclined and, and give them the data science beginner's toolkit. Right? Um, give them uh, uh, handfuls of tools and let them play around with it. Uh, but no, we do that ourselves. I, that's, a, that's a huge concern was relying on another, another piece of the org to do ETL. I'm not going to get in somebody else's queue. Yes, please. Depends on how you define science, right? Is so. So the normal the 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 move to a what? Oh, I got the STFU fine. So the move to nor, uh, normal science is going to be driven by a number of indicators. How do we know when we get there? There are a couple of things that I think that we'll be able to tell. One, um, are we making hypotheses? Are we publishing better papers? Are we making evidence-based decisions? Right. Um, is there, a, is there a national, or could ANISA or some other U.S. organization actually have more of a scientific bent than a, we're going to test firewalls bent and, and make policy documents? So I got the, that, but we can talk about those off. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the time.